Let's read together our text for this morning. <coughs> Hebrews 3, Hebrews 4, verses 3 and 4. Hebrews 4, verses 3 and 4. More especially the second half of Hebrews 4, verse 3 and all of verse 4. I read. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Beloved, the first exhortation in Hebrews 4, the chapter of our new series, concerns those in the church who behave like the unbelieving Israelites in the wilderness. Those people were characterized especially by grumbling, murmuring, and complaining. By grumbling, against God's word because it was too hard and too strict. That is, it counters my lusts and it requires thought and effort and sacrifices. They also grumbled against God's way, God's way with them individually and God's way with them as a body of his people. This was not what they envisaged. It wasn't as good as God had said, so they thought. And so, logically enough, complaining with God's way, they desired to go back to Egypt. The world, the false church, pagan religions, which all present an easier way than the cross of Jesus Christ, and whichever particular option is favored by the individual professing Christian. And ultimately, this unbelief and this behavior along the lines of the unbelieving Israelites in the wilderness, the New Testament equivalent of this is forsaking the assemblies of the church. As Hebrews 10 25 says. Usually it takes the form of withdrawal from church activities through the week, then skipping the odd Sunday evening service, then it becomes a pattern, then it becomes a habit, and then skipping morning services until there's a vacancy in the pew. Hebrews 4 Verse 1 says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise be left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. And so the calling of the church with regard to such people as we saw last week is to fear for them. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left claimed everybody in the congregation, anybody in the congregation should seem or appear to come short. Which implies that the people of God observe, and they cannot but notice, some unseemly behavior or absences in their fellow saints in the church, that they are concerned and troubled that all does not appear to be going well, and then the saints fear for such people. Where are they headed? If this keeps going, where will they end up? There is only one destination for those who continue in this line. They ruin themselves, they ruin their family, they adversely influence others in church. This can result in serious backsliding or a great and lamentable fall, which as the canon say can greatly damage someone's conscience, or even outright apostasy, which 
results in everlasting punishment in hell. Let us therefore fear, lest anybody here in this congregation should show signs that they seem to fall short of the promised land. <coughs> then the congregation prays for such people, encourages them in the way of the Lord, the right paths, and exhorts them, do not miss out on God's rest. Do not fall short and fail to enter the promised land. The picture that God painted in the first five books of the Bible, especially the last four, of Israelites, most of them, not getting into the land of Canaan, which pictured heaven. This calling, let us therefore fear, while addressed especially to the congregation, pertains also, and to a higher degree, to the church office bearers, whose office includes fearing for those who seem to come short, which of course is a difficult calling for the office bearers, and such work is all too often not enjoyable at all, and the work of the office bearers is all too often not successful from a human point of view. And ultimately, when a person gets set in their sin and persists in it for some time, then it can result in church discipline. So we are to learn from the sad example of Israel in the wilderness. For unto us, says verse 2, was the gospel preached, <coughs> as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Why? It wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard. So we then are to believe the gospel, to obey it, and to press forwards towards the everlasting rest of the kingdom of God. And our text this morning develops this rich idea of rest will be unfolded more fully as this series goes on, and it even speaks of the day of rest. Let's turn to the day of rest then, considering the institution of the day of rest and the parties, that is, those involved in, to participate in rest, the parties of the day of rest. The day of rest, its institution, and its parties. When did the day of rest begin? That is, when was a day of rest first instituted? And there are various answers to this question according to the various theory or belief of the individual with regard to the Sabbath and fourth commandment. Some people will say that the day of rest began with Emperor Constantine the Great in the 4th century AD. But that only refers to some sort of legal acceptance of a day of rest by the civil magistrate in the Roman and Gentile world. The Apostles three centuries earlier refer to a day of rest in the book of Acts, in the epistles, in the book of Revelation. And going back further, you will remember that there are references to the Sabbath in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, many of them, in the prophets, Isaiah 56 and Isaiah 58, for instance, in the Psalms, Psalm 92 being a psalm for the Sabbath day, and in the Old Testament historical books. This goes back to the tenth, the Ten Commandments given by God on Mount Sinai. The fourth commandment being, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, and so forth. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the 
the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. But you may also know that the Sabbath is mentioned earlier in the book of Exodus than chapter 20. In Exodus 16, verses 22 through 30, the Sabbath is mentioned in connection with the first giving of the manna. Exodus 16, verse 23, God speaks of the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Moses commanded the people on that occasion, eat the manna today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find the manna in the field. Six days shalt thou gather, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. That is, God provided the Sabbath on the first six days of the week. He gave them a double portion on the sixth. They were to collect twice as much on the sixth, so that they could eat it also on the seventh day. And verses 28 through 30 deal with those who refused to keep God's commandments and his laws and who went out on the Sabbath day to collect manna when God commanded them not to do so. So we're all the way back to Exodus 16. But this passage suggests and even presupposes that this Sabbath or day of rest was not totally new to the Israelites. But they had heard of it before and were well aware of it. So it is that our text this morning tells us when the day of rest began, for it speaks of the very first day of rest. Hebrews 4 verse 4, God spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. The first day of rest was the seventh day. It was a day of rest, a day of rest. And of course, Hebrews 4, verse 4, is quoting older scripture. The second part of that verse, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works, is a quotation, as indeed it is introduced as such, God spake in a certain place, namely Genesis 2, and God did rest on the seventh day from all his works. And so Genesis 2 verse 2 says, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Verse 3, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. And from this institution of a day of rest by God, on the seventh day, we learn a number of important lessons which help the people of God and help us to experience God's rest. The first of these is, we learn about the authority of the Sabbath, or the day of rest. The Sabbath, or a day of rest, one day in seven, is not merely of human authority, or even ecclesiastical authority. The keeping of a Sabbath is of divine authority. It comes by right to God. Therefore, we must remember the Sabbath day and worship on a weekly day of rest, not merely because of the word of man, or the word of a minister, or the word of the church, but because of the word of God. He is the one with whom we have 
have to do in the fourth commandment. This means that remembering and keeping the Sabbath is a moral duty. It is a matter of conscience. Your conscience should sting you for breaking this fourth command. As it should sting you, that's a good thing, for stealing or killing or lying or committing adultery or blaspheming God's name. Because not keeping and not remembering the Sabbath is a matter of sin. Always sin. Because with the Sabbath, we're not merely dealing with man or with the church, but with the living God. The Christian consciously, deliberately makes this a matter of conscience before God. And he doesn't just say, well, it's no big deal. That's what so and so says. Well, the church says such and such. Well, they would say that, wouldn't they? God. Along with the authority of the Sabbath, we see also the antiquity of the Sabbath, or day of rest. Hebrews 4, verses 3 and 4 says, The works were finished from the foundation of the world. And the works there are God's works, God's works of creation, and they were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. The first Sabbath then was enjoyed on the seventh day of the creation. The day of rest, therefore, is only one day younger than mankind itself. The day of rest is only one day younger than fish and birds. The day of rest is only three days younger than Jupiter, or the sun, or the stars. The day of rest is only four days younger than dry land, grasses, trees, and bushes. The day of rest is only five days younger than the sky. And the day of rest is only six days younger than light, or than time, or than space. The Sabbath, or the day of rest then, is not just 2,000 years old, the writing of the New Testament say, or 3,500 days old, Moses but over 6,000 days old. The day of rest is a lot older than the apostles, or the prophets, or Moses, or Abraham, or Noah, and it's older than Cain and Abel, though the Sabbath is not older than Adam and Eve. Now in our politically correct age, it's probably as well here to add that being old, in this sense, is good. Because in our politically correct age, the fact that something is old is usually not viewed as a commendation, but is usually viewed as a way of dismissing it. Have you noticed this? For instance, by many, the great tradition of marriage between one man and one woman for life, we say that should be observed because hundreds and thousands of years lie behind that. That is turned on its head and said to be a bad thing because marriage belongs to the dark ages or of the stone age. The reason for this is the, the advocates of homosexual marriage know that their view has zero support in the past. And therefore this argument against it must be dismissed and rubbished. Because their view is a novelty, historically speaking. 
It's the product of social experimentation by left-wing radicals and the product of a peculiarly and distinctively depraved age. And so contrary evidence, hundreds, thousands of years of tradition in that land are set aside because of that's old. But the antiquity of the Sabbath, or day of rest, is designed to add a certain stature and luster to it, because it is coeval with creation itself. A month didn't go past, not even, precisely speaking, did a week go past, but God said, we need a Sabbath here. And since God instituted the Sabbath right at the beginning of the world and time, then it must be for good and weighty reasons, because it is a permanent and abiding institution in this age and for our world. In short, the Sabbath, or day of rest, is a creation ordinance. And by creation ordinance, we mean something that God ordained. Ordinance. At creation, creation ordinance, for man's life on earth, from the creation onwards, until the second coming of Jesus Christ. And there are three great creation ordinances spelled out in Genesis 1 and 2, the first of which is work, the second is marriage, the third is the Sabbath. And these three creation ordinances are unavoidable and intrinsically tied up with this creation and what it is to be a human being. Vital components for human life in this world work all around us, unavoidable, six days. Rest, one day in the week. Marriage between one man and one woman as a means of friendship between the pair and support, as a means also of avoiding fornication, and as a means of childbearing and rearing, and thus the establishment of the family and the home. Our world is inconceivable without work, rest, and marriage, and children, and families, and the home. And that's the way God made it. And it is especially disastrous for society, and even more so, of course, for the church, if these creation ordinances are undervalued, undermined, and attacked work, marriage, and a day of rest. And in our godless Western ideological world, the creation ordinances, not just the gospel, are increasingly undermined and attacked. Especially at this time, one thinks of the promotion of sodomy as a good virtuous thing and even now it's exaltation to marriage that God made. But we're especially interested this morning in Sabbath desecration, the pressure to work. If you're not willing to work on the Lord's Day, there's no need you're even appearing for an interview. If you're not willing to work on the Lord's Day, you will never gain promotion in our company. The pressure on Christians regarding the Sabbath too, because our world is pleasure mad, and Sunday is viewed by many as especially a day not for the private and public worship of God, but for sport and the private and public worship of athletes. TV and entertainment attacks the Lord's Day, and all of this, especially in our day, promotion of sodomy, Sabbath desecration flows from evolutionism, which is a 
Israel, of God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, who gives us creation ordinances of work and Sabbath and marriage. These creation ordinances of work, marriage and Sabbath were not appointed by God after sin entered the world, but before the fall. They were created in the unsullied garden of Eden, before the forbidden fruit was eaten, and before man plunged himself into iniquity and brought the creation under the curse. And the Sabbath, or day of rest, is from several perspectives even more necessary for fallen man after Genesis 3. To go a step further, the Sabbath, therefore, this day of rest, is binding upon all mankind, not merely believers. And this flows from the three main points I've made before. The authority of the Sabbath is that of God, not merely man of the church. The antiquity of the Sabbath, it was ordained at creation so that it predates the church and the nation of Israel, and then this fact that it is a creation ordinance for all of created humanity, all mankind, not merely Jews, not merely Christians, not merely believers, just as much for all mankind as marriage and work, not being temporal or local. And so all men, believers and unbelievers, must keep the fourth commandment just as they must keep the other nine commands. There are no opt-outs from the Decalogue. Also, unbelievers cannot, are not able spiritually, to keep the fourth command. But of course, because they are equally unable to keep the other nine commands. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so the fourth commandment, like the other nine commandments, shows unbelievers their sin, and so shows the need for the gospel of Jesus Christ to proclaim, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, the fulfillment of the truth of the Sabbath in heaven. What about the parties of this day of rest? Well, the first Sabbath was very obviously, and first of all, the day of rest for God himself. And this divine rest consisted centrally of two things. First of all, he ceased from his work of creating. He stopped making things. In Hebrews 4, makes this point twice. Verse 4, God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Verse 3 talks about God's works being finished from the creation or foundation of the world. Genesis chapter 2 lays even greater emphasis on this. Verse 2, on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Verse 3, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. You may have noticed that I said very deliberately that the first that on the first Sabbath God ceased from his work of creating. He did not cease, and indeed cannot cease, from his own works inside himself. There is, of course, the eternal generation of the Son, perfect complete in 
entire timeless, the eternal generate, the eternal procession of the Spirit, the covenant fellowship and friendship within the Holy Trinity. God did not cease from those works inside himself. And God did not cease from the work outside of himself of providence. Because, as we saw last Sunday evening, providence began with creation itself in that God upholds and governs all that he made. So that's the first thing. God ceased from his work of creating. In Genesis 2 and Hebrews 4 call this God's rest. If we ask the children, how in all the world can God rest? Does that mean that God becomes tired or weary like we do? And that after a day's work, we like to sit down and put our feet up and recover? Obviously it does. God is omnipotent. And tiredness is no part of the divine blessedness. The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faileth not, neither is weary. Isaiah 40, verse 28. But God's resting means that he stopped creating and he ceased from that work. That's the first thing of God's keeping that first Sabbath. The second thing is that God also admired and delighted in his completed creation. And this idea is very easy to understand because everybody here knows about this and has experienced this personally. <coughs> You're decorating a room. You hang the wallpaper. You paint the ceiling. <coughs> you put up new curtains. You move the furniture. Get the pictures just so, and then you sit down, and get a cup of tea, and just look at it and smile and say, Got it right, finished. I like that, I'm pleased with it. Or if you want to go outdoors, you tidy up your garden, you get the lawn cut, you trim the hedges, you get the fence fixed, the flowers are coming on nicely, you've taken out the weeds, and you like it. In fact, you look at it when you go indoors, you want to come out and look at it again from different angles because you're pleased with the work that you have done. And children even do this too. <coughs> Making something, let's say, out of Lego. They're building a castle and they put the men on the little top and they have them pointing down, covering all ways of approaches. And they put the little catapults here and they look at it and everybody is happy with it, and then they'll often go to their parents and say, come, come, look, look, see what I've made. Yes, yes, it's very good, it's, it's wonderful. There's never been a castle built as well as that one, and the child is happy. Well, God, when he completed his work of creation, rested in it, admired it, delighted in it. You're well aware that with the first five days of creation, we read, and God saw that it was good. And upon the completion and perfection of the creation, with man as the pinnacle and climax of it all, we read verse 31 of chapter 1, And God saw everything that he had made, not just the light or the dry land, but everything and everything together in its place. He saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And then he rests, as it were, he sits back and looks at it and says, that's just what I intended to do. My plan is realized and it is wonderful. That's what God said about his world. Now, of course, there's some differences in God's looking at his work and our looking at the little things that we do. We find it almost impossible to do something and enjoy it without a certain measure of sinful pride. Maybe I should score out the word almost. We find it impossible because of our depression.
depravity. And everything which we make, because of the fall and the curse which lies upon creation, partakes to some degree of vanity and futility because nothing ever really works and functions the way it should do in this creation. And then when we look at what we have made, dealing with the created world that God made for us, we can see beauty in the things in themselves. But when God delights at his world, what delights him is his own wisdom and power and goodness and justice and truth in the works. That is, God delights in his creation, just as he delights in the church, because he delights in himself. And he sees something of himself in the works of his hands, because they reflect a little of his glory. So God kept the first Sabbath. Principally, he did it before man. That is, he ceased working, and secondly, he delighted in what he had made. But we need also to see that the day of rest, and even that first day of rest, that first Sabbath, is a day of rest for man. It's worth pointing out that Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3, the first scriptural reference to the first Sabbath, does not explicitly say that Adam and Eve rested on the first Sabbath, though it explicitly says that God rested. Verse 2, on the seventh day God ended his work and rested on the seventh day from all his work. Verse 3, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work. But nevertheless, there are compelling arguments that prove that Adam and Eve, one day old, did rest on that first Sabbath. The first thing we should think of is the truth that mankind, thinking now of Adam and Eve especially, is in the image of God, reflecting God. And God here creates, works six days and then rests a day, and he presents himself in this narrative as man's example. And this is precisely the reason why it took God six days to create the world. He could have done it in less than the time it takes us to click our fingers. But God took six days to create it, to set man an example of work, and an example of rest. <clears throat> and the book of Exodus proves this conclusively. Back now to Exodus 16, verse 23 says, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. And it was a rest for mankind. It was a holy thing for mankind. It was a Sabbath for mankind. And he's to do it unto the Lord. Even more clearly, Exodus 20, the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The word Sabbath, the word holy, sanctified. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. Don't do any work. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore he blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed or sanctified it. And it's the same thing in another reference to the Sabbath in Exodus 31, this time verse 15. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. And our Lord Jesus Christ understood this in his famous utterance, Mark 2, verse 27. The Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath was made at creation. <coughs> it's a creation ordinance. God made it. The Sabbath was made at creation for man. 
This is part of the argument too in Hebrews chapter 4. I haven't time to unfold it now. Next week, Lord willing. The argument of Hebrews 4 is that there remains a rest for the people of God. This chapter is about rest for us. And so when it mentions God resting on the seventh day, it's doing this as a pointer that we must rest and keep Sabbath and rest in Him. And so it is that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, we have a couple of other important verbs. God blessed the Sabbath, the Sabbath day and sanctified it. God sanctified the Sabbath day. God set it apart and set it apart for what? For himself? Does he need some special day? One day in Sabbath? God set the day apart for holy ends, for his worship and his praise. God set it apart for his worship and praise by man. Human race would honor him. God sanctified the Sabbath day and God blessed it. And when it says that God blessed the Sabbath day, it means that God blessed the Sabbath day as a means of blessing to us. God doesn't need to be blessed. He's ever blessed it himself. But he blessed it as a means of blessing to us. That is a means of sanctification of us. That is a means of setting us apart from the ungodly world and for himself. And so Adam and Eve kept that first Sabbath in paradise before the fall. They rested in God, his goodness and majesty. They rested in his work of creating and caring for them. So the fourth commandment, dealing with Sabbath, takes God's act of creation, as we've seen, and sets this as the template and pattern for mankind. God rests, and you, man, must rest. And this is the same in our Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 38. What doth God require in the fourth commandment? First, that the ministry of the gospel in the schools be maintained. And that I, especially on the Sabbath, that is, on the day of rest, diligently frequent the church of God to hear his word, to use the sacraments, publicly to call upon the Lord, and contribute to the relief of the poor as becomes a Christian. Secondly, that all the days of my life I cease from my evil works and yield myself to the Lord to work by his Holy Spirit in me, and thus begin in this life the eternal Sabbath. Sabbath is made for man. But this may raise in your minds this objection. Where is the evidence of Sabbath keeping by the saints between Genesis 2 and Exodus 16, the giving of the manna, and Exodus 20, the fourth commandment? What about that period? Genesis 2 and Exodus 16. Because it's true, there's no reference to the Sabbath as such in the remaining 48 chapters of Genesis or the, next, or the first 15 chapters of Exodus. But we ought to remember that those chapters are historical narrative. They're telling the story of the flood of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and they don't pick up what they did every seventh day. It isn't part of the plot or storyline. Think secondly of Sabbath and sacrifices. In Genesis, there are sacrifices, many of them. But there you have the practice of sacrificing without any reference to the appointment of sacrificing. You just see them, like Abel for instance, offering sacrifices without there being any specific reference that God instituted sacrifices. Now God did institute sacrifices, otherwise it would have been will worship. But you have the practice 
of sacrificing without the institution of sacrificing being recorded in the book of Genesis. With the Sabbath, it's different. With the Sabbath, you have the institution of the Sabbath without a reference to the practice of the Sabbath. But you could no more infer that there was no practice of Sabbath keeping in the period of the Genesis, because the Genesis doesn't mention it, then you could infer that there was no institution of sacrifices since it's not mentioned. I'm not sure everybody's got it, but I'm not going to believe the point. Here's another one. Think of it this way. One of the three creation ordinances in Genesis is marriage. What do you get in the book of Genesis? Polygamy. Concubinage, that is a sort of a halfway. And even rape. And you get polygamy, concubinage, and rape in the church, in the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You might, in reading those chapters, say to yourself, well, it's as if God never instituted marriage as between one man and one woman for life. Ah, but he did. <laughs> but they didn't keep the law that God gave. Polygamy, concubinage, and rape with Reuben. And here's another thing. Think of the mentions of the Sabbath in later history. Joshua doesn't mention anybody keeping a day in Sabbath, nor does Judges, nor does Ruth, nor does First and Second Samuel, nor does First Kings. Now we know that the law was given in Exodus 20, but the storyline didn't mention it because it didn't crop up. In fact, you come all the way to 2 Kings 4, verse 23, where you read of Elisha and the Shunammite woman in connection with the Sabbath. In fact, the Feast of Tabernacles, we're told in Nehemiah 8, verse 17, that since the days of Joshua, people didn't actually make booze in Israel as the Feast of Tabernacles required. And they didn't make booze as the feast required, even in the days of the good judges, even in the days of David, even in the days of Solomon, or Hezekiah, or Josiah. But you have to go all the way to Nehemiah before you've got people making the booze again, because it hadn't actually been done in the, day, the Feast of Tabernacles, until all the way back to Joshua. The absence of any reference to a practice with regard to the Sabbath of the book of Genesis is an argument from silence and it doesn't prove much and it doesn't prove anything. In fact, we haven't time so we won't look them up. There are references to Abraham in Genesis 18 verse 19 and 26 verse 5 as keeping the ordinances and statutes and judgments of God and teaching his household and family so to do. And given that he was a believing man and his family and household was very godly, they needed the Sabbath in order to do that. And Genesis 2 was its institution. And you know, people could argue in our day that really, if you look at the Church of Scotland, you would never know that there was a Reformation. They have homosexual ministers now as approved. There never was a Reformation. Obviously, John Knox never existed. There never was a Scottish Confession of Faith or a Westminster Confession of Faith because there were women ministers, women moderators, higher criticism of the scriptures, and they approved homosexual ministers. So there mustn't have been an Reformation. In fact, if you looked at the church world of Northern Ireland, you would say, really, there never was, there never were any Reformation creeds because most people never even heard tell them. And you would think that Jesus never said a single thing about church discipline in Matthew 16 or Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 because most people, most professing Christians have never heard of it in all their lives. So therefore Jesus never said a single thing about it. And in fact, to come near to home, you would think from the practice of the Western so-called Christian world that there never was a day of rest or a Christian Sabbath at all. And from the lives of most people even in Northern Ireland, you would never know that God made the world in six days and rest in seventh day and shrine it in the fourth commandment. And from the lives of many professing Christians, you would never guess that there was such a thing as a fourth commandment at all. Ah yes. Ah yes. 
But this doesn't prove that God didn't institute the Sabbath. This proves that man is wicked and the church is weak. And finally, we need to tie this up. Time's going on. This, beloved, ought not be true of us. We must remember our Creator on the Sabbath especially. We must rest in Him by admiring His great work of forming the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. And we must bless and sanctify His holy name. And we must enjoy and practice the Sabbath by resting. Resting from our physical labors. Resting from any notion that we can do any good so that we can merit with God. And resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. When He worked, and we just rest in what He did. And so we rest in the ever-blessed Trinity. And we rest in public worship twice each Lord's Day. And we rest in public and private worship the whole day. Amen.